All right. So I'm going to start with an assumption that you're all in this room because you care about security and somewhere there's a system that relies on you to keep it secure. It might be efficient, it might be your job, uh, it might just be that you're the person on your team that cares about this and you're the go-to person. Um, it might be people in your life that look to you, but somewhere there's a system that relies on you to keep it secure. Now, what does that system look like? I'm really bad at computers. All right. A bunch of cat cables and some spinning disks? Probably not. It's 2018. You've probably got uh, some enterprise cloud apps with your hybrid AD and you know, uh, a bunch of chunky Dell laptop somewhere, or you know, okay, maybe you're working somewhere a bit more uh, agile and you've got your, uh, everyone's being their own D, hooking it into a bunch of uh, web apps that are all held together with uh, web hooks and Slack bots and silent prayers. <laughs> uh, uh, you're the people making the thing and your system is code from the application layer right down to the infrastructure. Sound about right? Well, something's missing here. Things would be a lot easier if this was what our networks looked like, uh, but they don't look like this. Our systems are made of people. And people are complicated and messy and hard. So why are we treating our systems like people don't exist? Why are we drawing network diagrams where they're not even there? Referring to people only as users, as peripherals, extensions of the devices that they're using. Well, people are a hard problem. And it's easier to decide they're out of scope. So we treat our systems like they're not really there it's part, of, part of the problem is that we put people in charge of these systems who only really have authority for the technical bits. We treat it as a technical problem. And when there's a technical problem that causes a breach or some kind of incident, that's a problem of governance and of internal IT processes. But when something goes wrong because an ordinary person made a mistake, we blame the user. They should have been more careful. They weren't hacked. They used weak credentials and they got themselves pwned. They should have been more careful. How can users be so stupid? But what if people aren't the problem? What if the problem is that we are failing to secure the most important and the most vulnerable part of our network because we're not treating them as an integral part of it. We treat people like they should be part, like they should be a machine, and then we blame them for being bad at being machines. And this is just leading us to not only a really ineffective approach, but really adversarial relationship with the people that we're meant to be helping and securing, because we need to make people secure to make our network secure. So, what can we do differently? How can we help to secure the most vulnerable part of our system? So, a bit of background on this talk. Uh, for a long time, I used to be a public servant. I wasn't really a tech person. I did some techy things, but wasn't really part of it. Uh, but I was very good at finding problems uh, and saying, ah, there's something here that hurts people. We should fix that. 
um, I was not very good at getting someone else to say, ah, yes, we will fix that. Um, <laughs> I felt like, does anyone know the story of the myth of, of the fall of Troy? And Cassandra of Troy, who was cursed to be able to see all of the problems and never be listened to, and never have anyone say, ah, yes, yes, we should protect our walls from this problem. Uh, so I felt like that, uh, and so I eventually very uh, calmly left and only flipped a half dozen tables and became, I don't like the word defensive, I, so I left, I left security, uh, sorry, I left the public sector because they weren't listening to me. They listened to consultants. They get these people in, they tell them what the problems are, so I'm only coming back to this place as a consultant, you know, because they, people listen to them, and if they don't listen, it doesn't matter because you're gone. You don't have to care anymore. Somehow, magically, I'm not quite sure how that happened. Now I'm a security consultant. Um, I don't like to use defensive. It's a very negative word, defensive. So, hi, I'm an inoffensive security consultant. <laughs> so I get to do inoffensive security and go into these places and say, ah, I've seen some problems here with your system. Let's work on fixing them. And it's still hard. People still don't listen to me, and for some reason, I can't not care. <laughs> there was a flaw in my plan. But I have, so in, in the course of this, I started looking at the reason things weren't working. Why is it that you can give people the best possible advice? They're paying for this advice. They still don't take it. Uh, I started doing some research around the human psychology behind this, and that's the basis of this talk the things that we need to do. It's a technical problem, but it's not the kind of technical problem we are used to, and so it feels very hard. So, common scenario, you need someone to understand a thing. It's very important that they understand how this thing works and why it's important, so you don't just post a Slack message or send them an email, you, know, you get face to face and you explain it to them very carefully, you know, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, yes, I understand what, what you're saying. You think that they've understood, they think they've understood, and then you discover too late in the fact that they haven't understood. What's going wrong? <laughs> so people's brains don't work like a computer's. We think they do, we talk about them as if they do. We don't just take in information, process the information according to rules, and then spit that inf uh, information out, store it for later like a computer. Humans make sense of their world by making connections. We take in a situation, we pick out the bits that seem relevant to us, we compare them to what we already know, things that we've experienced. And so if people don't have the same reference points, if they've taken in things and interpreted them differently to you, they're going to understand the information that's in front of them in a different way to you. And that leads to confusions that you don't necessarily realize are there until it's too late in the pace. Uh, this way of taking information is it's flawed, it's vulnerable. Uh, it also makes us uh, incredibly adaptable uh, and resilient because we don't have to be limited to situations we know how to handle. We are infinitely capable of edge cases we never even imagined to be possible and say, ah, yes, I know how to react in a situation like this, or I think I do. But when it goes wrong, it fails, and it tends to fail silently. So we need to find a way to bridge these gaps in communication. And the best way I've found is to tell stories. Because if you're telling people something very precisely, if you're telling someone the technical facts of the matter of the system that you understand very well, the problem as you see it, people aren't taking that in because it doesn't fit onto their mental scaffolding in the way that you imagine. So we need to find analogies, common ground, common reference points. And that's led me to some, uh, some analogies and stories that seem unlikely. I mean, I've got a gym membership, I don't go, I'm their ideal customer never ruining the equipment, but I'm still paying their, uh, their bills. You know, I've never owned a car in my life, but I spend a lot of my day job talking about 
fitness programs and car maintenance. Um, so I've got some of those stories for you today to help explain some of the ways that humans work, the unintended consequences of that, and what we can do to help them along. So one of the problems with human brains is we have this idea that, you know, we work like computers, but we're smarter than computers, right? Yeah, everyone wants to think they're smarter than the computers, and that leads us to think that we are better than we are at things that computers do very well. Uh, so, <laughs> one of the things we're particularly bad at is understanding risk. Uh, human brains, you know, we take in information when things are novel to us, when you know, they seem scary because they're unfamiliar, we don't know how to respond. The moment things are familiar, we get comfortable. We let our guard down. Yeah, we uh, don't worry about, we can imagine, because we're imaginative beings, the most outlandish hypothetical scenario involving these exotic threats. But when things are routine, meh, it's fine. I'm sure, you know, I don't want to cause a fuss. I'm sure it's nothing. Yeah. So we have these, these systems that assume that people will maintain a state of constant vigilance. This is how we teach people to avoid being fished. Every time you get an email, apply all these rules. No one will ever send you an email that asks you to click on a link or that has bad grammar and all of these rules that legitimate companies are doing every day. And every time someone sees one that says that ticks those boxes, they say, oh yeah, that's, that's legitimate, I trust that, I know that. And the next time they get one that is a phishing attempt, that has those same things they've learnt to, you know, it's probably fine, it's probably nothing. It's making it easier to dismiss that threat as not a big deal. So people can't maintain that constant state of vigilance. We need to make it easier for them to question, to feel safe, saying, hey, I want a second opinion, and not feel like they're going to be shamed for um, making a big deal out of nothing. Or, and also, we need to make systems so that when people do make mistakes, because they will make mistakes, that it's not fatal and that it's an opportunity to learn. I'd like to introduce you to the Voynich Manuscript. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's one of my favorite mysteries. It's a 15th century manuscript, all hand-colored illustrations of strange plants no one's been able to identify, and it's written in a script. Pages and pages, volumes, written in the script that no one's been able, able to identify. Cryptographers and linguists have attempted it for hundreds of years, and modern computer research has been able to show that it fits these patterns that a real language follows. So when humans try to make up a script, uh, you know, we try to, try to write in like random nonsense, it's predictable. It looks like it's made up because when humans try to be unpredictable, that's when we're at, a, at our most predictable. You can, there are algorithms that you can run to tell when someone's made up the data set on a scientific study. You know, we have an idea that certain numbers are more random than others. And so we're building these systems where people are told, oh, to keep everything secure, you need to have a really random password. And then we got surprised that people were choosing the same random passwords as each other. <laughs> but that's fine, because you know, we learned, we no now know that people are predictable and we build the algorithms that um, can spot that. So we don't tell them to do that anymore. We tell them, get a password manager. You know, Get that to make up your passwords. Choose past phrases that you're not going to forget. You know, just a bunch of ordinary dictionary words. And it's going fine, right? Everybody's got a secure password out there. Everyone's using these things. It's fine. It's good. We fixed security, guys. All right. I want you to imagine a dinosaur. Just get a really vi a vivid mental picture of a dinosaur. All right. Now... We know, scientists know, you have probably heard that T-Rexes have feathers. <laughs> but when you imagined it, I'm going to 
bet that that first thing that comes into your mind is Jurassic Park. It's reptile, it's scaly. Uh, that's something called belief perseverance. When we learn something, we take in this new fact, and that's now our truth that we use to understand that thing. And we're not good at unlearning what we already know. So when we're telling people, actually, you should write your passwords down now. Actually, you should use a dictionary word or four. People, no, no, but I was told no. You told me no. This is bad. And it's hard for them to accept this new reality. So we need to, to get people to this new state. You can't just tell them, no, you're wrong. We don't like being told we're wrong. Uh, take them through the process that you went on to get to this new state of information. Yes, we believe that to be true. And then people started building computer computers that could guess the kinds of things we were doing to get to these passwords. And we realized that people were reusing them because no one has that much mental space to dedicate to passwords. We have better things to think about. So you need to take people through the steps to help them understand why the advice has changed, rather than simply just telling them, oh, it's changed now, we don't do it that way. I'd like to introduce you to a friend of mine, the uh, mascot of Hamilton City. Uh, for the Australians in the room, this is the Pukeko, the Australasian swamp hen. Uh, it is New Zealand's most prosperous ground-based birds. They can fly a bit, but they tend to hang out on the ground, um, unlike most of our ground-based birds that are threatened and relying on security through obscurity by pretending to be extinct for 50 years. Uh, Pukeko is doing just fine, thanks, and it doesn't get much respect in New Zealand because we all hate a tall poppy. Uh, <laughs> Pukeko are thriving because they take security seriously. Now, fun facts about the Pukeko. They form polyandrogynous communities. Uh, it's very rare in the animal kingdom for animals that form sort of breeding non-pairs, uh, for it to be mixes of males and females with no particular um, preference for which, but they sort of form groups between three and six birds and all put their eggs into a collective nest. And then everyone in that community keeps an eye out for the eggs and for the chicks, and if they see anything that might be a threat, they all raise the alarm, even if it's nothing. They still raise the alarm because they've got a culture of it's better to put the word out there and then someone who is able to, who has the ability, one of the adult members of the community, will actively fight off that threat. They've been known to kill stoats, which makes them a patriot, <laughs> uh, to New Zealand's bird community. Uh, they, uh, you know, they've been seen fighting off hawks and cats, uh, and their numbers have thrived. And now they're everywhere, and nobody loves the poop keko. <laughs> um, so I find them a great model for thinking about security because pukekos care about it and they take it seriously. And everybody in the pukeko community has a role to play. So how do we turn people into pukekos? Well, <laughs> Pukekos have it easy. In a Pukeko community, the only thing they have to worry about is keeping the community alive, running around, like, doing their Pukeko thing. They don't have day jobs. <laughs> uh, most of our security measures fail because we go in there with advice that's really, really well-intended and say, here, this is a thing you need to do, and people say, yes, but there are other things going on. Um, humans are really reward motivated. Uh, we, we're adaptable creatures. <laughs> it's what makes us uh, resilient. And we adapt to a situation. We look out for the things that we can take advantage of there. We uh, find ways to make it work for us. And so when you're telling people to do a thing that doesn't work for them, that doesn't get them rewarded the way that doing the thing their boss wants them to do so they look like model employee or fitting in with their workmates, they go, ah, shame, I don't want to do that. So th we need, if people have other competing demands in their job, find out what those are. Find out why. Go and talk to people. 
uh, a lot of design thinking stuff sort of talks about empathy in terms of imagining yourself in someone's shoes. Don't take their shoes. You don't, I, I, in my former life as a public servant, I was a historian. I had no choice but to imagine how things were. I find it very weird when people do this when you can just walk over and talk to a person. You don't have to make it up. You can just go talk to them. Find out their stories. Find out why things aren't working. Um, so there'll be certain things in your organization, in your community that are explicitly rewarded. Um, find out what they are and work with them. If you've got a place that we don't do security uh, in the development pipeline because it's really all about the things that are billable, we need to get this code out. The customer's not paying for that. Find out how much time you're spending on those pen test remediations. Find out how much time you're, sp you're spending rewriting things or responding to incidents or, you know, these things that are taking time, that's the thing that's the most valued commodity there, and find ways to give people time back. Give them things that will automate or that will help them detect problems now and fix them early so they can save time later. So security is often seen as a thing that makes demands, it's taking from people, it's, you know, it's a cost center. So part of being successful is to flip that and find ways to be generous, give people things, give them the thing that the organization values most. And not all values are explicit. One of the reasons these things fail is because there's implicit cultural, you know, often where we sit a bit outside the people we're trying to secure. I mean, I'm a consultant, I work for different companies, then I'm going in there to help. Uh, but even when you've got an internal security team, it's seen as an adversary, it's over there, it's us versus them, it's this person who's telling us things to do um, and shaming us when we don't do them. Um, so find out what people are implicitly valuing and find ways to work with that to, um, if they find the people who are the influencers, who are the people who people there listen to, and change, work with them to change their behavior first. If no one's gonna do anything because, you know, no one wants to be the first one to start locking their computers, or no one wants to be the first one to start doing a thing that no one else is doing, um, start insisting on peer reviewing their code when no one else here does it because you know, we're all smart and we trust each other. Um, find the people who are the implicit influencers and work with them so that other people follow suit. And you also need to start breaking down those barriers, those us and them, by people. I've got a newsflash for you. People are scared of us. <laughs> I mean, I don't know why we've been like telling people that they're, we think they're stupid for years, and somehow they find us really kind of hostile and mean. I don't, I don't get it. So <laughs> be vulnerable. Admit mistakes. This culture of smart people don't make mistakes I would never do something like that. It's widening that barrier. It's creating this us and them environment where people don't want to listen to you because people want to work with people and do things for people they trust and they like. And they don't trust us because they think we're going to be mean. <laughs> so. We've taken away the barriers. Now, the next thing is we want people to take security seriously. How do we get them to care about security? Well, maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> Hi, I'm here to tell you today we should not try to get our users to care about security. <laughs> security is a means to an end. We should get them to care about things that security is the way of achieving, like protecting people from harm, from having their information exposed. Saving them from the time and stress of on-call incident handling. So, who here cares about the environment? Yeah, good, yes, cool. Um, so, you all take your own bags to the supermarket, right? Yeah, why, it doesn't really do anything. Like a plastic bag, in the scheme of things, is not really helping, that drinking straw not the thing that's gonna like, you know, bring the rainforest back. But small actions make us feel in control. 
small actions make us feel like we're part of the solution. And when we're part of the solution, we start looking around at others and saying, well, what, you didn't bring a bag? We were going to the supermarket. You know, you, why would you do that? And then we start looking at the, the bigger things, the things that can really make a difference and say, hey, I'm here, bring in my bags, very inconvenient. What are you doing out there, you know, chopping down rainforests for, you know, full of orangutans? This is not cool. I demand better of you. We start expecting things to improve where they really matter. But it starts with simple gestures that ordinary people can do to show that they care. So we need to find ways to normalize caring. So I grew up in the 1980s. The big, the big environmental threats then were save the whales and the ozone hole. Like we did both. The humpback whale was endangered. And now it's on the least vulnerable list, at least concern. It's actually doing all right. And the ozone hole is actually starting to shrink again. And it's because people gave up their cans of hairspray and then started looking at the industrial use of those gases that were causing the hole and say, actually, we don't want you to use these in these applications either. So this actually works. You know, the things of my childhood that I believe were the unwinnable threats, we're now starting to win against them. So how do we actually get this to turn from caring into action? Um, some of the places I've gone into, worked with, that have had the strongest security culture, they do something really counterintuitive. Uh, they, um, they start with the security awareness advice that completely ignores the workplace. So you've got a place where there's no Facebook on company time, strict uh, social media policy, and they start their security awareness policy with, all right, how do you lock down your Facebook privacy settings? Because security is a means to an end. And the end is helping people. And people care about helping the people they care about. So start with the people closest to home. Their wife, you know, the, the wireless router at home, their Facebook account. Anyone got kids? A few hands, yeah? So those beautiful baby photos, you want to keep them all safe and protected so that you can embarrass them on their 21st, right? Yeah, yeah, so this is where we start, you know? How do we back up those photos and make sure that they're there, not just so that you can get them tomorrow, but that you can get them when Theo's uh, 21? All right, so now you understand backups. Now you understand why we say, don't save that on your computer, save that on that drive over there. So when people understand why it's important because it's tangible and real to them and it's about something they actually care about protecting, then you can take that and apply it to your context too because we're making those associations, we're making those connections from one idea to another idea. We're teaching by analogy. And when people really feel invested in this, they start to champion it, champion it for others. They start there on the phone line saying, oh, no, no, don't give me your credit card detail. Please do not tell me your password. Absolutely no, don't do this thing. It's not safe. I want to protect you because I feel like I can. So that's it, really. I mean, I'm sorry if you were expecting some really profound advice. There isn't any. <laughs> Make connections tell stories, listen to other people's stories. People are only human. They're vulnerable to making mistakes. That's how we learn. They're reward-seeking. That's why they don't do things that seem thankless. This advice, like all security advice, it's common sense. And we know that people don't follow common sense. <laughs> Mostly because it's hard, because these things are so obvious, but in the heat of the moment, they're very hard to do because you forget, because you just want to brute force it. Make people do it. So 
we have to be mindful. These are things that we can only get good at by practice, by doing them, by basically practicing this, keeping them in your mind all the time. Uh, so that's why, instead of publishing a deck of slides for the great uh, vault of knowledge, uh, I have released this as a coloring book. <laughs> you can take the blanks <laughs> and you can color them in and you can think, who am I protecting? How do I help them on this journey? How can I get people to take security seriously like the Pook Echo and make the whole system more secure? Thank you.